good evening good morning and good afternoon ladies and gentlemen it's a huge pleasure to invite you to this mega webinar which is with a star cast from iffs the international federation of fertility societies the beauty of this webinar is that while we have panelists from across the time zones uh Uh, we also have a huge amount of audience from all across the world not only from india but from united states from the from europe from middle east africa asia and it's going to be a great uh, experience in trying to interact with all of you without much ado i would like to introduce my moderate co-moderator dr rishma pai who is the assistant treasurer of the iffs she is the past president of the federation of obstetrics and gynecological societies of india Foxy, which is a member society of Figo, and the past president of the Indian Society for Assisted Reproduction (ISR), which is a member society of IFFS. She has also been the past president of the Indian Association of Gynecological Endoscopists. Rishma, thank can you. you take a thank you. Hello, and welcome to the International Federation of Fertility Societies webinar. ART and COVID-19, preparing now for now and the future. IFFS was founded way back in 1968 as an organization with 65 national fertility societies and over 50,000 physicians and allied health professionals as its members. It's a non-state actor in official relations with the World Health Organization. All of us have now been shaken out of our comfort zone by the sudden onset of this COVID-19 pandemic. However, over the last few weeks, we have begun to adjust to the idea that this pandemic, with its risks and problems, is here to stay for a fairly long time. As countries across the globe slowly begin to open up and attempt to resume a somewhat normal life. The question uppermost in everyone's mind is is it safe to go back to routine work do we have all the systems in place and to help you answer all these questions bothering you we have today an expert team of IFFS from across the world from USA Ireland Spain and Argentina and they will help you prepare now for the present and the future in your art practice so let's go ahead uh with uh our symposium uh let's begin by saying a thank you to uh an unrestricted educational grant from intas we are indeed grateful to you for supporting this academic activity before we begin i would also like to bring to your notice that we will be taking questions at the end of this meeting so please submit your questions uh, as we go along and we will address them at the end also uh, we will be sending you a recording on your email once the uh, procedure once the entire webinar is over and lastly towards the end of the meeting we will have a survey we would like your opinions on it and this will pop up at the end of all the talks so thank you and enjoy the rest of the seminar rishikesh now thank my co moderator will um, uh, introduce our first speaker rishikesh is the director of corporate affairs of iffs he has been the past president of the indian society of assisted reproduction isar as well as the past secretary general of the federation of obstetric and societies of india So, Rishikesh, can you have uh, uh, mic uh, and take over and uh, introduce our first speaker? Thank you, Rishma. Uh, I would like to introduce, and it's my pleasure and privilege to introduce to to the world-renowned Linda Juris from USA. She is our <laughs> present president of the IFFS. She is the present FIGO chair on reproductive and developmental environmental health. She is a distinguished professor and Robert B. Jaff. endowed professor in the department of reproductive medicine at the university of california san francisco or popularly called ucsf she has been the past president of the american society of reproductive medicine and the past president of the world endometriosis society 
she is internationally recognized for her work on environmental influence on reproduction and she will be take, talking to us today on restarting art practice setting the stage professor linda thank you very much and i would like to extend my welcome also to all of the attendees and to thank my colleagues so i will begin today by setting the stage and then we will have uh speakers addressing clinical considerations for restarting art practices the embryological aspects and code of conduct followed by q and a so i will focus on what do we know about sars-cov-2 in reproductive tissues what do we know about sars-cov-2 in pregnancy and conclude with some issues for restarting art practices So first, what do we know about SARS-CoV-2 and its receptors in the reproductive organs? In the male, I'll show you some data. In the female, there are very little data on the female reproductive tract, and there are some data at the maternal fetal interface. And these all have relevance to infection, organ infection, possible dysfunction, and possible sexual and vertical transmission. Now I think we're all aware of the SARS-CoV-2 structure, single cell RNA, and that is basically the basis of the qRT-PCR test. In addition, there are the spike proteins and there are receptors, the ACE2 and also the protease. And the protease is important for activation. and the ACE2 for attachment. Now, quite interestingly, in the last month, there has been an explosion of information about ACE2 and protease expression uh in big data sets. And there is a cell atlas called the COVID-19 cell atlas from the Sanger Institute Human Cell Atlas and the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative at my own institution, the University of California. And what they have done is they have gathered the single cell RNA sequencing data from multiple tissues in healthy human donors. And they have looked at the single cell RNA expression in a variety of systems, respiratory, sensory, nervous, lymphatic, urinary, digestive, and the reproductive system. Genes that are expressed positively um are highly reliable in their expression but absence of expression has to be interpreted with caution due to isolation and other methodologies ace2 because there are the two things now that we're looking for in these big data sets one is the ace2 expression and it's expressed in most data sets and the protease which is generally highly expressed with broader distribution but it's very cell specific for both of them and sometimes and this is important that there is no co-expression of ace2 with the protease because there may be alternative proteases this shows the gene expression distribution of ace2 and the protease in 14 different cell in 141 cell types from 14 different tissues and you can see in the colon for instance there's high co-expression of both but there are other tissues where there's not that concordance and there is a data set or several data sets for the reproductive system for first trimester placenta and decidua and also in the testis that's at the rna level and then here you see protein for ace2 in the human testis So what do the data show? The data shows so far and with single cell RNA expression and here is a nice single cell uh what's called a Tisney plot and you can see the different cell types. So here are the spermatogonial cells, here are the early sperm spermatocytes, they go around the elongating uh, spermatids, Sertoli Leydig and other cells. These are all the cells in the sample. The cluster by cell type Then when you look for ACE2 you find it in the spermatogonial cells as do you find the protease. And you can see that they are co-expressed. In the Sertoli Leydig cells 
which are in one cluster there, ACE2 is abundantly expressed with less of the protease. What about the biological processes that are involved in these ACE2 enriched cell types? Well, you can see that the red is the upregulation, the, the blue is the down, and processes associated with viral reproduction and transmission are in highly enriched ACE2 positive spermatogonia, while male gamete generation related terms are downregulated. In the Sertoli Leydig cells, the um, cell junction and immunity related terms are upregulated, <clears throat> and the mitochondria and reproduction terms are downregulated. That's quite interesting, but it's not uniformly observed. For instance, a very recent study just two weeks ago uh, reported that 34 men confirmed COVID-19 positive by QRT-PCR of nasopharyngeal swabs. 19% <clears throat> had scrotal discomfort concerning for viral orchitis at the time of COVID-19 confirmation. They tested the semen. However, no hormones were me measured and no semen analyses were performed. But what they found was that SARS-CoV-2 was not detected in semen after an average of 30 days from the diagnosis. They looked at their own data, this is from Utah, where these are now again single cell data, transcriptome data, and these are all the different cells, as you can see here. And what they found when they mapped for ACE2 and the co-receptor, they found very little expression with almost no overlap. So their conclusion was it is unlikely that SARS-CoV-2 targets the testis. Another recent study um, was done in which 12 men confirmed COVID-19, 11 mild and one asymptomatic. And they also examined the testis of a deceased male. All the men were positive for QRT-PCR. And they also measured anti-SARS-CoV-2 IgG and IgM. One specimen was collected during the active infection. So the uh, filled in diamonds show active infection. So here's one. And then two days later, the semen specimen was obtained. But most of these were conducted after recovery of a uh, negative uh, virus. And this is the deceased individual. What they found was that SARS-CoV-2 RNA was absent from semen and testis in the men infected during the acute and recovery phases. So the data so far and relevance to sexual and reproductive health include that the cl initial clinic clinical studies support low risk of testicular infection or sexual transmission with recovery after infection and with mild COVID-19 symptoms. What about acute infection and with severe COVID-19 symptoms? There are also, as we've seen, conflicting data about COVID-19 receptors in the testis. And so far, no clinical data are available or have been published on possible altered testicular functions, sperm parameters, or hormones. So this article in um, Reproductive Biology and Medicine Online recently suggested that more research is needed on this and other viruses that can affect the testis and may be sexually transmitted. So these issues are highly relevant to sexual and reproductive health counseling of patients and ART practices and safety for patients and the general population. Now, what about the first trimester? What about the uh, maternal fetal interface? The data that are available are in the first trimester specimens. This group, Lee and colleagues, two weeks ago published about the single cell RNA sequencing and their analysis of it with regard to ACE2 and the protease using a data set that was available by Vento Torno. And here you can see the syncytiotrophoblast, the uh, extravillus trophoblast, the villus cytotrophoblast, and they measured uh, and they looked for rather ACE2 expression in this data set. 
and they found that ACE2 was abundantly expressed in the villus cytotrophoblast, in the syncytia cytotrophoblast, and in the decidual phenotypes, but not in the extra villus. At the level of the decidua, there was abundant expression of ACE2, but not so much of the protease. And in the epithelial cells, um, some modest expression, but quite a bit of expression also shown here in the, in the uh, villus cytotrophoblast, which is where the air exchange and uh, nutrient exchange occurs with the fetus. So those are the data for the receptors. What, are, what do we know about pregnancy? We know that pregnant women are essentially a high risk population for um, um, cardiopulmonary disorders because of altered physiology and immune modifications. Uh, the largest series of was had 55 pregnant women with COVID-19, most mild, all in the third trimester. Uh, two were ventilated, no maternal deaths, 2% miscarriage, 10% IUGR, 50 40% preterm birth. One small case controlled study showed no differences in pregnancy outcomes of women with versus without infection. And five placenta of women who had no pregnancy complications, but were COVID-2 positive at term, were noted to have uh, villus thrombi, but no complement and no viral RNA detected in the placenta, suggesting the placental findings were due to systemic infection per se. In the neonate, a case series of nine pregnant women with COVID-19, all the mothers were positive by nasopharyngeal swabs, and all of the neonates were negative. Two neonates in a separate study had positive swabs at 30 hours, and it's been raised that perhaps this was perinatal transmission. There were three cases of negative swabs, but positive newborn IgM antibodies, which shouldn't be crossing the placenta. And these newborns also had elevated C-reactive protein and cytokines and evidence of some uh, liver inflammation. Just recently, there was one case report of severe maternal complications with SARS, diabetic woman with pneumonia, ventilation, C-section with the newborn immediately isolated and the nasopharyngeal swab was positive at 16 hours and the IgM and GG were negative. So with regard to vertical transmission, the presence of IgM in the neonate, inflammation and pneumonia are suggestive of vertical transmission, but all reports so far show no virus detected in the placenta, amniotic fluid, cord blood, vaginal secretions, or breast milk. And we have one report of positive nasopharyngeal swab in a newborn with strict isolation so far. So with regard to pregnancy, early gestation placenta shows high expression of the ACE receptor, in the syncytia trophoblast, the villus trophoblast, in the um, syncytia trophoblast, and in the perivascular cells in decidua and fibroblasts, and low expression in the invading extravillus trophoblast. The receptors seem to be increasing with, gest with gestational age, and we do know that term placenta normally expresses high levels of ACE2, likely because it's part of the renin-angiotensin system. Despite no expression data, despite the expression data for SARS-CoV-2 receptors, clinical data suggests little vertical transmission, and as mentioned, no virus has been found in the placenta or in these uh, fluids. But there are some things we need to uh, acknowledge. There are limited numbers, and all of the reports so far have been in the third trimester. There are uncertain risks of vertical transmission, unknown effects on early pregnancy exposures and outcomes, and impact of the disease on pregnancy and why there might be different clinical courses among women, and the unknown impact of disease on fetal and neonatal outcomes. These are all important in counseling patients about embarking on a pregnancy during this pandemic. 
And indeed, ASRM, ESHRA, <clears throat> and IFFS COVID-19 task forces are providing guidance as ART practices are beginning to restart. Issues that are important are counseling patients about unknown risks of pregnancy and transmission, safety certainly of pregnancy, of patients, pregnancies, children and families, safety of staff, of community, um, PPE supplies, the need for standard operating procedures and workflows, and the need to focus on the well-being also of patient, staff, frontline workers, and, tra and trainees. This is very much a fluid situation. And this is just one example uh, of one of our professional organizations, ASRM, that initiated issued its first guidance in the middle of March, basically with a pause to, uh, for IVF procedures, except in those women requiring urgent fertility preservation. These have subsequently been updated. Importantly, in, on March 30th, the affirmation that infertility is a disease and infertility care is not elective. And then um, the most recent one provides recommendations to allow for a safe, for a carefully considered gradual resumption of patient care with safety as a top priority. And the next update from ASRM will be published um, next Monday. My other colleagues will be presenting uh, additional information from the ESHRA task force. I want to thank you so much for your attention. That was a fantastic uh, presentation, uh, Dr. Linda. And uh, lots and lots of people uh, from all over the world are listening in, appreciating the in-depth knowledge uh, that you're giving us, not something we can just read uh, off the internet, uh, you know, the kind of information that you're giving us. So uh, different time zones and um, lots of questions pouring in. So thank you very, very much. And we are going to, of course, come back to you uh, later in the uh, program. Thank you. So now uh, I would like to introduce our next speaker. And uh, our next speaker is Dr. Marcos Horton. Uh, Dr. Marcos, would you be sharing us your slides with us? He is yes. the treasurer of IFFS. He is the ART lab director, Pregna Medicina Reproductiva from Argentina. He is a specialist in clinical infertility, ART ultrasound, and the uh, reproductive surgery. He's a medical advisor for vRepro, an IVF application from uh, Reprosoft at, uh, located at Spain. And uh, very, very busy working, including right up until the webinar started, he was seeing patients. So thank you, uh, Dr. Horton, for joining us, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Rishma. And, uh... I want to thank especially this, uh, the organizers. Um, I'm very proud uh, to be here talking to such a big audience of all around the world. So I will focus on the clinical and practical considerations. And uh, I will start by saying that uh, we have to think about why is it uh, wise to open. And uh, there has been some discussion about this for the last uh, few weeks, uh, months, and there are ethical considerations that we should uh, consider. Obviously, inf infertility is a disease, so there is uh, an ethical consideration, and we have to balance the rights of the patients and the risks, and this can be easily done with a thorough informed consent and, and with enough information. Although this is an evolving situation, and the information is all the time, in real time, getting to us. So uh, this is something we have to really talk with the patients and give all the information we have uh, updated to the last minute. Uh, we are receiving uh, every day more information on the relation between the SARS-CoV-2 infection and pregnancy and a little bit about reproduction. But as uh, ART will restart around the world, we will have a lot of information, and this is quite an exciting moment in, in spite of the, of the big problem that it is because we have a lot of information and a lot of trials going on, especially, obviously, uh, as a clinical approach. But we will have a lot of information on lab, 
ART and results in a few months. So um, this is an evolving situation. So if you see right now, this is updated uh, the Johns Hopkins map today. It's already more than three and a half million people in the world that have uh, contracted the virus and already more than 250,000 deaths. So it is difficult to uh, have a general consideration for all the situations because the, the different countries will have different uh, situations. And right now the epicenter of the pandemic is in the United States. It's going down in Europe, but it's still uh, in the early stages in Latin America and Africa. And it is a different situation between the different countries and regulations in place. So we have to take into consideration when to open and how to open, depending on your local situation and what your local and regional regulations uh, say, because it's obviously a, a big in inconvenience to be in quarantine. And this is a problem for all the logistics involved in ART practice. So we've seen uh, with Lynn's presentation, and I have also learned something this morning because uh, she has uh, updated all the information on the infection and reproduction, what we know, although it's uh, scarce information, we will have more and more coming in, and the relationship between the SARS-CoV infection and pregnancy that is quite optimistic, although there's still not, not much information and organizations like ESHRA here, you can see that in their COVID-19 information website, the, you have uh, here a, a register to start inputting data on the ongoing pregnancies. And this is a fantastic opportunity to have all this information from the beginning. And there's other organizations in the world that are doing this. And there is some registries in Italy and one from UCSF where Linda works, also uh, now uh, ongoing and reporting all the data from the pregnancies. And if you look at our website, we have uh, constructed a resource center on reproductive health and COVID-19 that I invite you to visit. Uh, we, we've done a, a tremendous effort trying to collate all the information from the societies, all the guidelines that are updating all the time, and also on the clinical information, the clinical trials that are ongoing, and also the information on uh, pregnancy and reproduction. But this is a resource center that we are uh, all the time updating, so it's useful information if you want to visit it. But what we do know, what do we know about COVID-19 propagation? And this is a recent editorial in New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, because there is a really uh, a big concern on the asymptomatic transmission of COVID. So this, there is a high viral load in the upper re respiratory tract, and it's very, in, in the early onset of the, of the disease, you have a high viral load. So this is different from the previous coronavirus uh, infections, where propagation would be after symptoms are present mainly. And this is more like the influenza virus that has also some pre-symptomatic propagation. Although in the influenza infection, there is a low viral load in the upper respiratory tract. So if you see what happens in, in SARS, uh, the 2003 virus, you started the viral shedding. This is a primary case, and this would be a, a secondary case. And you see the viral shedding goes after the symptoms appear. And if you look at influenza, you could have some viral shedding one or two days before symptoms. And if you look at now the new uh, coronavirus, the SARS-CoV-2, uh, apparently we have a lot of uh, a high viral load in the upper respiratory tract, and that can be present even two or three days before the onset of symptoms. And uh, the other important thing is that we have a lot of asymptomatic carriers. And if you look at this uh, paper from JAMA in April, it, looking at a familiar cluster in China, this is patient number one that had never had symptoms. The, the, the orange lines are the symptoms. And then this, the, the, the pink lines are when the PCR was tested positive. So this was a patient that went to Wuhan 
and then uh, arrived in another city in Anyang to visit family. She uh, infected two f uh, uh, family members. Then they went to visit a family member in a hospital and they infected another three uh, family members. So the, the first patient didn't have symptoms at all. And after the patient number six had symptoms, they began to study the rest of the cluster. And so you see that this can go on for two or three weeks, maybe without any symptoms. And this is the main take home message that I would like to, to uh, uh, have from today that we will be uh, receiving a lot of patients and most of the patients that we will receive after triage will be asymptomatic or oligosymptomatic. So this is very important when, you, when we look at how we're gonna triage patients and what tests are we gonna ask and for who. So restarting ART, it's very important, all of these items. This is safety first, obviously. All the guidelines are looking at safety, especially. And this is true for patients and also for healthcare workers. So the, all the personnel has to be protected and all the safety measures have to be taken into consideration. And all of your clinics will have to be reorganized. I can tell you from personal experience, we've started uh, after 40 days of quarantine here, we have uh, talked to our Ministry of Health and we are uh, negotiating a reopening of the ART clinics and prioritizing patients, as some of the guidelines say, starting with uh, patients that are time sensitive, low ovarian reserve, oncofertility, et cetera. But it's very important to reorganize your clinics. And this is very important, the communication the internal and external communication, because in these days we are all in our houses and we lose track of, of all the employees we have in the clinic and there's a lot of stress and anxiety. And so we, we need to keep the communication. And these All these uh, tools we have now are very important to keep uh, the, the staff together and, uh, and to coach them and to train them in, in all the information we have to give them. Also the external communication with patients that will feel stressed and, and, and left aside with all the situation. So it's very important that all the training we have to do. And especially when we reopen, we have to follow the guidelines of our Ministry of Health. Uh, so you have to see your own, your own local regulations because obviously whatever guideline we can uh, uh, produce will be uh, obviously below the, the uh, Ministry of Health uh, of each country's uh, regulation. So one of the important things will be the triage uh, we have to do. This can be managed uh, by the personnel, the staff in the clinic. Everyone has to be triaged before attending the cleaning. And this is uh, a, a simple questionnaire of five or six questions. Have you had fever? Have you had tough? A cough, sorry, and all the typical symptoms. And also if you have been in contact with somebody for the last 14 days. So this, we've implemented this with a Google uh, site a survey that's very easy to implement. So that, that gives you some tracking of, the, of each patient and you should also triage your personnel. So telemedicine has helped a lot in this, uh, in this uh, last two months but it obviously has to be regulated in each country. And uh, we've seen also that in the States, it, it's still in, in the, in the uh, uh, first steps of, of this situation, but it's a very useful tool. And we have seen a lot that we, we don't have to see so much uh, of the patients, especially for the first consultations that we can do through these systems. Also scheduling has to be rearranged to have uh, patients uh, not overcrowding the waiting rooms. So the waiting rooms have to follow the, the social distancing uh, uh, measures that is very important. And we have to reorganize all our front desk uh, personnel with a, a proper protection, the, the face masks and also the, the social distancing. But we have to think of a lot of details that we didn't have in consideration before, like the paper use, you have to minimize the paper. Uh, so we, you don't have to, to uh, all, all the objects that you use have to be sanitized, the pens that you use for signatures. So a lot of thinking you have to do to reorganize your, your clinic. 
also the patients should know that they will have to come by themselves and sometimes if there's some necessity we can call the husbands or, or the, the couples uh, um, to come in for the consultation but not to overcrowd the waiting room so there's a lot of, of reorganization that will take uh, maybe two or three weeks before you can start uh, again with this uh, approach. We have to look uh, clinically at the gradual approach uh, and is, this is in line with the guidelines we have received from a lot of societies around the world. We prioritize patients that are coming for gamut storage. Or obviously, oncofertility patients are a priority, and we uh, actually never stopped uh, uh, treatments in these patients. Uh, low ovarian reserve patients and time-sensitive patients, for example, recipients of egg donation that have, you know, there is a, a, a lot of logistics in these kind of treatments, so we, we need to prioritize them. It's a, a very important, the informed consent, and this has to be updated regularly because the informed consent we have today, maybe uh, it's not the same uh, a month from now. So it, it is a special informed consent, and we have uh, developed that with our own Ministry of Health to, as an addendum to the uh, normal informed consent. So it's very important, all the staff training, even though we are all doctors and nurses, et cetera, we have to uh, uh, grab all these new information on the virus and the infection and, and the new information that is coming up. Uh, use the protective equipment that this can be uh, limited to really the uh, operating room where you could be exposed to uh, the aerosolization of secretions and it's especially important for the anesthesiologist or the cardiologist, the ones who are in contact with the face of the patient and not so important for the, for the other staff. But once you have a, uh, a suspected case, obviously this will change completely and you will have to use the protective equipment in those cases uh, that, that, that appear in the middle of, of the treatment, for example. Obviously, all the information and personal hygiene and what happens when you really spot a case and you have to implement an emergency procedure that has, that has to be written and all the SOPs have to be updated uh, regarding this. And the last uh, item I'm gonna talk about is about testing. And this is important uh, because of, of the uh, moment that you're uh, looking at the, the pandemic, the evolution and what's happening in each country. Because nowadays we, we will have probably a different prevalence of the infection, for example, in Latin America compared to Europe and probably compared to China or to India. So you have to see what's your own situation in the evolution of the pandemic. And for example, if you want to diagnose, you will have to use the PCR tests. And we don't know uh, to, to if it, we're going to do it to all the staff and, and how with what frequency. And that has to be uh, uh, said by the guidelines. If we look at, uh, this is from uh, Yale University and some information that came, came out last week in, in another webinar too, and they uh, just uh, uh, recommend testing to the, to the following asymptomatic groups, not recommended. Asymptomatic contacts of known cases, routine screening of patients returning to cleaning, to a clinic or routine screening of healthcare workers. When you go to antibodies, uh, you have to see also where or when the prevalence is higher depending on the evolution of the pandemic. And we have seen that all the quick tests may have low sensitivity, especially for IgM antibodies, around 70% sensitivity, that is quite low. Probably ELISA uh, uh, tests are better, but the routine serological testing is not currently recommended in any patient population. A lower positive result may indicate prior infection we know all the uh, conflict there is and, and if these antibodies are really uh, giving you uh, a defense or not and for how long. So there's still some information we'll, that we need. And if we go to the ASHRAE guidelines that I won't, won't talk much about them, but if you look at the green, yellow and red scenarios, and this would be the triage negative uh, 
patients that will go into the start of the sim stimulation. And you have to remember that this will be two weeks before the treatment. And then we have another triage at the beginning of the, of the treatment. And you can go to a standard procedure and maybe go to embryo transfer if you talk this with the patients and they agree. But if you have a, a, a second scenario where there be a mild symptom or, uh, or a, a patient that could have been in contact with somebody, then you should test for antibodies according to ASHA guidelines. Even though we have some doubts on the sensitivity and the value of these tests, we have to do these tests for the scenario too, and then decide on the uh, results from these tests. And obviously the red flag is a postponement of all treatments. So I will finish my presentation here and uh, we'll follow up later for the questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Marcus. Uh, that was an excellent overview about how we can restart our private practice post-COVID. I think he has focused on the asymptomatic carrier, which is our, going to be our biggest bugbear and how we would be able to, whether we can test everyone or there should be a triage as Eshre and many other organizations has said that you should have a triage and maybe do selective testing. Uh, overall, he has given a very good overview and I'm sure we'll get back to him afterwards. And there's a, already more than 2000 plus uh, 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 doctors, embryologists and other clinicians wow. have logged on, logged on to the program, Marcus. And, uh, with, without much ado, I would like to now go to our next speaker, Anna. Uh, we can have a presentation. She is the dynamic senior embryologist and reproductive biologist from Barcelona, Spain, Dr. Anna Vega. She has held the prestigious position of the chairman of ESHRI in the past. She is presently the special advisor. She is the R&D director of biology, area of reproductive medicine of Dexas Women Cell Care. She is also the director of Barcelona Stem Cell Bank, regenerative medicine program called ID Bell. She is the associate professor of Vida of University, Pampu Fabra. She is famous for her pioneering work in assisted laser hatching, and she is part of the SC COVID 19 working group and will be throwing light on restarting ERT practice, embryological aspects. Over to you, Anna. You need to restart your mic. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and thank you uh, for the invitation. It's a real pleasure for me to uh, to share this uh, this presentation with experts such as uh, the IFFS uh, officers. Um, what I would like to cover in my presentation is how to prepare now and for now and the future with regards to the uh, to the lab, to the IVF lab or to the ART lab. And this is what I'm going to do. As it has already been mentioned, um, we have a working group in ESHRE. Uh, it's called ESHRE COVID group. You have here the members of this group belonging to different countries. Some of them are clinicians, others are embryologists. And what uh, the aim of this group, um, the aims of this group are, is to keep track of the emerging data on COVID and reproduction to ensure a timely update of ESHRE guidance. As you will see, we have already produced two statements regarding first, a cautious statement saying that um, the activity in ART should be stopped. And the second one in which we are giving recommendations and guidance on how to, to restart the activity. Also, um, we wanted to provide um, uh, accurate response to questions from professionals and from patients and also from the press. And um, again, uh, we were ready or we were trying to collect as much, as, as much scientific information as possible to try to have more data uh, on, on uh, this, uh, this crisis, this, this pandemics. Um, you have here, in fact, uh, a map of what happened, and this map um, is the date is the 24th uh, of April. What was the situation in different in the different countries in Europe with regards to the activity? 
And as you can see, for example, in the red countries, no uh, centers were performing AFE. The situation is quite different uh, in Europe or was quite different in Europe with regards to stopping the treatments. And as uh, uh, Marcos has already mentioned, um, the, the, the um, the pandemic in the different countries was so different that countries reacted in different ways. So some of them were really scared and had their health services in a very uh, terrible situation and had to stop any activity that was not urgent, while in others the situation was not so bad and the activity in AIT could still be continued. I have to tell you that now this map is being updated and what we have in, in the what we will have in the next edition of the map that will come really soon and will be on our website, on the Azure website, is how different countries have restarted their uh, activity, uh, obviously in all cases, uh, according to uh, the national regulations. As it has also been said, you have to follow the national regulations in your country, uh, Ministry of Health guidance to know exactly uh, what to do and how to do. Uh, as I already mentioned, we have produced two different statements in the, uh, for this uh, working group in ESHRE. The first one was um, a statement from the ESHRE for phase one, when trying to um, uh, recommend um, uh, a stop in the ART um, activity at that time. And the second one who was published uh, on the 23rd of, of April was a statement from ESHRE from phase two. It was a guidance on recommencing ART treatments. Some of the data on this uh, document have already been presented. I will not go through them in detail. You can find all these documents in the ESHRE website uh, and also an, an updated list of references um, regarding COVID and, and reproduction that are um, regularly updated by our, our senior uh, researcher in, in, in the Asia Central Office, Natalie Vermeer. Um, the first, the most important thing to say, um, as it has also been, been said, is that when you want to restart the activity, um, you have to focus mainly in safety issues. Vigilance and measure step must be, taking, uh, must be taken for safe practice and to minimize the risk of uh, that are related to SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-CoV-19 positive patients or staff during, during the treatment. We have to minimize the infection risks, both in patients, in samples, and in the staff. Patients, and this has already been uh, covered, um, need to go or there is a recommendation that they should go to a kind of screening. Um, and this depends a lot on the availability of the tests. And this is also extremely variable in different countries. Some countries have the possibility to test patients with PCR, uh, with antibodies. It has been said that uh, these, these quick tests are not really reliable. ELISA seems uh, the good solution. In any case, social distancing should be the rule for that. And um, it's obvious that ART laboratories and ART programs must update their SOPs to try uh, to um, generalize the, the good use of the practices there. Everybody has to do exactly the same thing in the IVF center, in the IVF lab, including the IVF lab, cryopreservation lab, PGT, and, and andrology. Uh, all ART labs get be prepared one week before the starting of the activity with patients and samples. If the lab has been completely closed, it's obvious that the labs need to be restarted um, and you need at least one week to do that. It, it can be recommended that at the time of the patients initiate their stimulation, it's a good time to, to, to start preparing the lab. Uh, we have different things that we need to do. We have to clean and disinfect. There, you have to have uh, updated SOPs for the protection of samples and staff. And you have to use adequate protocols for disinfection. 
Uh, it seems that compounds made of quaternary ammonium or sodium hypochlorite or 70% ethanol are the correct ones. Even if you see in this slide, there are different kinds of uh, biocidal agents that can be used, but we have be, to be very careful because some of them are not appropriate to be used in the IVF lab because they produce volatile organic compounds that are really detrimental for the culture of uh, oocytes uh, and embryos and, and, and the use in the lab is, is completely forbidden. So really be careful because even if the clinic or the center uh, follows a disinfection um, uh, procedure, it needs to be certain that the lab is a very special place and we need to be very careful about, about all of this. About the equipment, it's obvious that we need to, to put the incubators, the lamina flows um, functioning, and we need to revalidate the functioning of this equipment with adequate uh, quality control measures if the, the activity has uh, been stopped completely. With regards to the staff, I will not go into detail. This has already been covered by Marcos. Screening um, has to be considered in at different levels and depending, as I said, on the availability of tests. Uh, we have to uh, guarantee minimal on-site presence, again, depending on what is uh, what are the, the consequences of the pandemic in that specific population in, in countries where um, there are very little um, infected people. This can be um, different than in others where uh, the pandemic is, is causing uh, a lot of, of stress to the health system. Social distance needs to be maintained and rotation of teams can be considered um, while having two different teams going in the morning and in the afternoon, not to have everybody together at the same time and to minimize uh, the contacts. Protect, um, Protection uh, is ensured by different ways, depending, again, on, on the extent of the infection in that specific place, but with the use of masks, of gloves that need to be changed between procedures, and depending on what um, that embryologist is doing, glasses can also be used uh, for uh, eye protection. With regards to the samples, and this has partly been covered by... by um, by Professor Giudice. Um, in, pr in principle, there is no evidence of the presence of the virus in sperm. You have here two references that have also already been covered there. There are no data on follicular fluid. We don't know if the virus uh, ca can get there or not. Uh, and uh, obviously, all the time, we you need the, the lab needs to follow the guidelines for good practice in IVF laboratories, and I here present the ones from Asia, but there are other scientific societies that have their own and that are being used um, all over the world uh, very efficiently. So we need to work as well as we uh, have been working before the COVID uh, uh, pandemic. Another important thing is, and this was in fact a question that was put in, in, in our website when, when we said that we thought that uh, all sites and embryos could not um, get infected by the virus. This is a paper that in fact has not followed um, uh, peer reviewed. This, is being, uh, this was submitted on the 10th of April um, in uh, archive, and as you know, these these publications do not do not uh, follow the rule of, of peer review. They are just put there, and in fact, the, these authors um, have investigated if the virus can affect early human embryos, and they are. Uh, uh, analyzed through RNA sec data sets of human embryos for these two receptors, AC2, uh, the protease that Linda also mentioned, um, and the endosomal protease, another protease for the spike protein activation. And they showed that these two receptors were uh, co-expressed in a proportion of epiblast cells. And um, also that the cells of the blastocyst express genes encoding for other coronavirus receptors, such as the ones that you see in here. I have to mention that um, this, this uh, report that, that does not include a huge number of embryos. I think that in total, um, 
10 to 11 uh, uh, embryos were analyzed in, in the different groups. So, so at the end, the conclusions have to be taken uh, cautiously. But in fact, the, the conclusion of this, of this paper is that developing human embryos express the receptors for SARS-CoV-2 and other coronaviruses, and they also harbor the necessary machinery for viral internalization and replication of the virus. We need to take into account that even these, um, these structures are there, oocytes and embryos have the zona pellucida protection. So even these, these um, they could be in theory um, be infected, the zona pellucida protects them. Uh, it doesn't seem that sperm can be affected by the, or can be infected by, by the virus, but we need to give a special attention to biopsied embryos. As you know, uh, biopsied embryos have a, a break in their zona pellucida and uh, could be more accessible for the virus to, to, to infect uh, these structures. Again, these data must be taken uh, cautiously because I would say that they are not conclusive enough to say that uh, embryos can be infected or, or not. Um, I'm finishing my presentation, but I wanted to cover um, uh, cryopreservation as a special as a special um, issue in, in my presentation. Um, in our recommendations in ESRE, we said that fertility preservation should be considered an urgent medical treatment. And we recommended that this should not be completely stopped, even in uh, the highest um, uh, terrible moment of the, of the pandemics. So um, in those cases, multidisciplinary discussion and adequate patient counseling uh, should have been done. And this is continuing in, in our labs and, and centers. There are no published reports, uh, reports on, the vi on virus, on this virus and cryopreservation and storage or the presence of this virus in liquid nitrogen. The data are scarce and so, uh, so we do not have the availability of this data. No specific recommendation on cryopreservation and storage can be given except for the general recommendation to follow good clinical and laboratory practice. And again, I, I give you a, a, a reference and this comes from the tissues and cells um, uh, directive, European directive that tells you how to work with that. But in any case, if uh, you are forced to cryopreserve samples from SARS-CoV-2 positive women, we must apply similar culture and freezing protocols as for samples infected with other viruses. We know uh, how we have been dealing with samples that came from uh, seropositive uh, for HIV patients, and the same protocol should be, should be considered. What we need to avoid is cross-contamination between samples that in fact has never occurred in samples with uh, other viruses and contamination to staff is also to, to be avoided. Um, in any case, um, you need to register that this sample can be or is from a, a positive woman um, for, for the COVID-2. Um, samples have to be processed at different times, not together with, with other samples uh, in, in the lab. And in, for the storage of these samples, maybe uh, the possibility to use uh, security straws should be considered. And as you perfectly know, liquid nitrogen vapors are more uh, safe in terms of liquid nitrogen to store samples that can have a risk of, of contamination. And these uh, are some of the references that uh, I think can be useful to anyone that wants to have more detail. They come from uh, the ACDC, the European Center for Disease Control. They come from the WHO. They, they come from uh, many other sources. And I think that anyone that could be interested in having uh, this information can get access to, to, this, uh, to this information through, through the links that I provide. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uh, Anna. This is really um, one of the most difficult areas, I think, that we will be facing today because um, there's so many questions and so much that is unknown and so many fears of uh, 
the embryos or the sperms uh, getting infected. And like you mentioned about, you know, if the zona is hatched, then there is uh, even further risk, how to cryopreserve. So lots of questions coming up uh, for your talk as well, which we will address later. But uh, thank you for this uh, excellent um, presentation. And uh, gives me great pleasure now to introduce uh, our next uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Edgar Mokeno. Uh, Dr. Edgar, of course, is the president-elect of the IFFS. And he is a consultant at the Rotunda Hospital in Dublin, Ireland. He's an honorary senior lecturer in, R uh, lecturer in REI of the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. And uh, he is obviously the immediate past chair of the FIGO REI committee. And he has many ESHRAE commitments as well. So a very, very experienced, very, very knowledgeable person. Uh, and we request uh, Dr. Marcos to please uh, give us his talk. Dr. Uh, Edgar, is your mic uh, muted? Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pai, for the introduction. Thank you, the IFFS and the uh, Indian uh, Society for putting this uh, webinar together. I know uh, the hour has passed, so I will try to be succinct. I will not show any evidence, but I would like to provoke you uh, by going backwards and forwards here. My talk is about a code of conduct for staff and patients. And uh, while the scientists are worried what happens with the virus once it's inside the ART facility, I would uh, plea that you have to start thinking, how do we prevent uh, people that are sick from entering the ART center? So think anybody entering the ART center, that would be my core message in, in this talk. And uh, I would like uh, maybe to draw your attention to this uh, wonderful quote from a religious Indian, um, uh, the Indian Bible, so to speak. Uh, and it says, uh, who sees all the beings in his own self and his own self in all beings loses all fear. And remember, fear is the true word here. We're all afraid of starting. We're all afraid of what will happen if somebody with COVID comes through the unit. So we need to identify ourselves as practitioners with the patients that come through our doors, but also with anybody that comes through those doors. So this is a picture from my room at the last ASRM. It had this beautiful net, which was a metal thing. And I'm sure all of you feel like this, prisoners in your own homes, prisoners within your own thoughts, how do I get out of here? And believe it or not, patients feel the same. We are this side, how do we go back into accepting that it's safe to go into an ART unit? So from that perspective, I will talk about the rationale why a code of uh, conduct should be in place. Uh, what, should con what should the code of contact contain? Who is our target audience? how to really implement this and maybe summarize it succinctly. So the rationale is very simple. I think our primary duty is to take as little risk as possible. And remember one thought, everybody else is you, is me, and we are all one. Think that everybody is the same. So from that perspective, each individual needs to ask themselves, do I want to get infected? No doubt, nobody wants to get infected. What should I do to avoid getting the virus? If I get it, who else might or will get infected? If you're an embryologist, you might say, if I'm off work or even if you're a doctor, what are the consequences? Remember that all these services rely on staff to maintain the clinical side, the laboratory side, the laboratory side, the uh, admin side, the telephone conversation, and so on and so forth. And also, finally, um, and this is a rhetorical question, am I responsible for the health of others? And I think this is the time, and this is the key to restarting safely the services. And the answer in my mind is yes, everybody is responsible for the health of others, including their own health. 
So what should this code of contact include? Well, I, I believe it should include four important areas. Firstly, we, and when I mean we, I mean everybody should think risk. We need to identify people that are sick, that have cough, that have temperature, that are sick looking. Just avoid the contact. If you see somebody sick, try not to be in their company. And of course, if you need to give them advice, do so. We need to think about people that work in an environment that is more likely to um, induce infection, like hospital, medical staff. We need to avoid contact, avoid busy places, avoid travel to areas of high risk. And we need to, of course, maintain a safe circle around us. We would like to remain within a circle of known, healthy family and friends. We all need to continue developing our social uh, networks. You need to act. Try to simplify your life. Do you really need to go shopping five times a week? No, you don't. Wash your hands and wear masks uh, at all times. Expose yourself less. Expose yourself less. Avoid the crowds. Avoid the opportunity to get sick. I think it's also nice if you're an embryologist or a physician to inform the others of your responsibilities and the fact that you care for others. So thus you might say, no, I don't want to go for a drink or I don't to go on the golfing course or I don't want to go uh, bowling. Uh, and of course, uh, most important is to inform the center if you think you exposed yourself to risk or if you become sick. The next will be to adapt. And this is important because we don't know if this virus will completely go down and if we don't, and we don't know if the uh, virus will start uh, reoccurring in certain areas of the world or everywhere. So if we are aware that the prevalence decreases, I think we should remain cautious. But if the prevalence increases, we have to become stricter. We cut down nearly everything and we just go from home to work and work from home. And probably the most important thing is to repeat the process. Keep all this in mind. We have to maintain constant awareness that we have to protect ourselves and we have to protect the others. And after these principles, I'd like to stretch your imagination by introducing you to what I think that is the target. Uh, we're talking our patients, IVF, and of course, oncology. We're talking our staff, and I'm talking about everybody that comes in. We're talking about contractors. Many units might have cleaners, for example, might have service personnel that, uh, personnel that attend to service their equipment in the laboratory, their ultrasound machines, their uh, IT systems, their electricity power. And we, of course, have company representatives. So all these people could be potentially introducing virus in the unit. Also, think about the accompanying persons. Uh, somebody might bring a friend into the unit and you'll say, well, they can't bring a friend. Well, somebody might need to be uh, accessing the unit in a wheelchair. They might need somebody to actually um, guide them. Think about medical stuff that comes from other services. You could have an oncology patient that is very sick that maybe needs to come in with a nurse of another service. And also think about, when you might hear the ambulance going around to return to the hospital, think about emergency staff, ambulance police personnel, fire personnel, if you have a complication in your unit and you need to bring in an ambulance, that ambulance stuff could be the crowd that could reintroduce your uh, uh, a virus in your unit. So you need to think broad, not necessarily get panicky, but just as widely think who could be infecting our unit. So think everybody. If the door opens, who is there? That's the principle. Make it visual. If the, our unit door opens, who is there that could potentially introduce the virus? So this is how it will really work. Firstly, we need to convince everybody that all participating parts uh, have a common interest to stay healthy and allow treatments to continue. Firstly, we need to educate, educate our patients, the staff, and all other service users uh, on the risk of the COVID infection. We need to go into detail as the practical recommendation uh, and the conduit for all, both outside and inside the center. Uh, we only to agree, and there's no harm to sign. So a code of conduct between center and all visiting parts, and this document to be signed and stored in the center database as proof that we have taken every measure to reduce the risk. Uh, and um, I think uh, you have to acknowledge from the beginning that no system will be 100% proof. 
But if you take every single step that I described here, the risk will be far, far, far less. So ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to uh, maybe mention to you that I discussed that from the beginning, this initiative must start. Before you open the door, you have to have the system implemented. You have to target all individuals that are entering the RT center. You have to uh, confirm in writing the action of taking responsibility to protect oneself and thus protect the others, and then have a step-by-step -step guide for everybody. And let me just take you from this beautiful uh, beach um, somewhere in Africa um, about social distancing. There's nobody there. And to the next step, uh, because human beings will now want to have social proximity and uh, you'll have lots of people gathering together and maybe say that the uh, truth is somewhere in the middle that whatever we do from now on, we need to express social responsibility. We need to show it and we need to educate our staff and everybody coming through. So to summarize, the code of conduct needs to be sustainable. It has to have a buyout from all parties and a continuation of this agreement is essential. It has to evolve according to the experience, adjust on the go and improve our conduit depending on how the scenarios change. And it has to respect everybody. It's a matter of understanding that all beings are affected if one is sick. Last but not least, I'd like to um, uh, introduce you to the International Federation of Fertility Societies website, uh, where our aim is to deliver knowledge, and um, there's a lot of information there if you would like to visit it. So I'd like to say thank you, and I'm very happy to take any questions you might have. That was a fantastic uh, uh, talk by Edgar, and he really underlined that the important matrix that binds all of us, as far as the return of practice is concerned, is the code of conduct. And it is based on the five pillars of educate, agree, sign, detail, and document. So these are the overall uh, perspective which uh, he has given us. And now I would uh, like to request our president, Dr. Linda, to conclude. Thank you so much. Um, I want to thank all of the presenters and the moderators, uh, all of whom are part of the IFFS leadership. Um, today we have heard about the uh, SARS-CoV-2 with regard to its receptors from the embryo um, to the um, some cellular components in the testis and also at the maternal fetal interface with so far no positive uh, viral RNA found in the uh, semen, at least as of today, May 6th, um, and also none found in the placenta or in um, breast milk and amniotic fluid. Uh, but I think we are all aware of how limited the data are and that we still need additional data with regard to these items. Um, also, we have heard with regard to the clinical considerations for care. Uh, testing is certainly an important part of the paradigm. Um, and protocols and workflow and distancing and safety um, are critical. Um, we also have heard about the laboratory, the protocols, the standard operating procedures, the issues for cryopreservation. Um, and uh, also, finally, with regard to the code of conduct, uh, heightened awareness amongst all of us about these issues. And as the uh, virus tends to decrease over time, we may let our guard down, uh, but we still need to be aware because of the predictions that there may also be an augmentation and waves of disease in the future. So um, we are now at a point, I want to thank everyone again, and we're now at a point for questions and answers. And I'd like to turn this over to the two moderators, Dr. Rishma Pai and Dr. Rishikesh Pai. Rishma, I think you need to mute. Unmute. Sorry about that. 
Yeah. Thank you, Linda. And we have uh, a lot of questions. But before we go on to that, I'd like uh, to request all our uh, people who have tuned in that we have a little poll or an evaluation that will come up on your screens. And I would request all of you to take that poll uh, now. Uh, it's very short. It's just multiple choice. And uh, it's really a feedback uh, about how you um, liked uh, the program or if you have any suggestions for us. And before I take the questions, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank um, all our speakers and especially uh, thanks to Christian Burke, uh, who's really been coordinating on behalf of the IFFS from USA. So thank you, Christian. Uh, also our um, fabulous dream team from Science Integra uh, with Subu and Shishan and their team uh, for all the technical support that they've been giving us during this webinar. And of course, um, a big thank you to Intas for their um, academic support for this webinar. And uh, I will now start with the one of many hundreds of questions which are pouring in. So a very, very simple question, the first one. Uh, maybe, Linda, you can address that. It's, it's, it's uh, really hard to conclude. Is ART safe when the pandemic is going on? So a very basic question like that from uh, Dr. Zhang. So the question is if ART is safe while the pandemic is going on. Um, this is a highly multifaceted question. Yes. Uh, part of, I, I think, what has been presented today um, really encompasses the uh, procedures we need to take to assure that it is safe um, because programs are restarting. Uh, we are all hopeful that the uh, pandemic will be, is decreasing in some areas and we're hopeful that it will continue and also will decrease in other areas. So life will begin again in many different ways and with the appropriate safety procedures and precautions and awareness, um, we certainly hope that it will be safe in the future. Yes. Now and in the future. Yes. <laughs> now and in the future. So I can maybe uh, ask the next question. I'll do. Uh, I'll ask Marcus this question. That uh, there's a question from Dr. Maria Monica. Uh, uh, embryos uh, uh, decertification in the time of, of COVID or I think maybe the, this would be better. Which one have been the ethical questions you discussed before returning to activity? This is from Dr. Paula Severino Bavio. Which ones have been the ethical questions you discussed with the patient before returning to activity? Okay, the first thing we uh, talk about is, is about the safety uh, of uh, measures that, I mean, repeat all the social distancing and, and the measures to protect themselves and the, and the healthcare workers. Um, we, we first emphasize on, on the situation, the pandemic and the measures. Then we talk about the uh, ethical dilemmas on the the information regarding pregnancy and COVID. And we talk about the, the scarce information regarding reproduction, but we, but we uh, talk especially about what we know now on pregnancy and its relation with COVID infection. But mainly we, we talk about also the different alternatives that they have as cryopreserving or uh, cryopreserving eggs or cryopreserving embryos and not transfer. So it's a, a, a multi-layered uh, uh, question that, that we solve with the patients by talking uh, in, a, in a sincere and upfront manner. I mean, we are all living the situation, so we are open and, and sincere about all the limitations that we have. But but. I think that is the best way to, to do it safely. Um, thank you. Dr. Edgar, a question which we haven't really addressed yet. Will COVID-19 affect fecundity? And this has been asked by Dr. Chengxi Li. What is your opinion, Dr. Edgar? Obviously, we have no evidence yeah. uh, that it does affect it. We have some evidence from the SARS-CoV-1 uh, pandemic, 
where studies have looked at impact, uh, pre firstly, presence of virus in the testicles and in the semen. Um, there are no studies, to my knowledge, that are linking SARS-CoV-1 with a decrease in sperm parameters or quality. Um, I, it depends if uh, the question refers to the general population or just the infertile, and that is really very difficult to answer. Um, but if restrictions continue, I believe that fecundity will go up. Uh, because people are definitely not going to work. And um, <laughs> although we, we are focused thing. on ART today, we have to remember that there is life before ART. So if you talk fecundity, um, that's the area that we have to address. Yeah. So I think we have no evidence, but um, we have to observe what happens. In right. fact, uh, that's a very good point, Dr. Edgar. Probably we'll have more of people become I mean, staying at home, but getting to the next question, Dr. Anna, and this is from uh, Dr. Nilanjan Chattopadhyay, and he has said, he's asked that inside the lab, other than the PPE, what are the features we would expect from the manufacturers to provide some safety in the IVF lab to healthcare workers? Is there any safety uh, equipment, maybe filtration systems or whatever? Would you recommend that? I would, I would say that um, the work in the lab uh, is always so strict that we work in conditions uh, where we could expect the samples to be uh, contaminated with um, any other uh, virus or whatever uh, bacteria that, that could make them infectious. So we already work in very safe conditions. But in that case, in the case of, of this um, crisis and this pandemic, I would recommend to use more uh, strict measures in the lab um, obviously, social distancing is what I have already said, but also the use of masks is obviously uh, compulsory. Gloves, as we always use, maybe uh, if you're treating a COVID-positive patient, double gloves would be more, more appropriate. And as I said, glasses can also be used uh, when, when there is a risk for um, uh, vaporization of whatever you are using, which is not in most of the cases very, very usual. But yes, I would recommend using a special measures, especially if you consider that you have a risk of being exposed to uh, a COVID positive um, a sample. Yeah. Well, Rishma, one sec, I would like to ask her one more question. That, that Because there's a lot of asymptomatic population. So would you like recommend masks for every patient, irrespective of whether there's an infection status. And there's one question from Amit Patki in India. Would you use sodium hypochlorite solution in the lab to clean up? Yes, I would use sodium hypochlorite solution. Obviously not when you have your samples exposed, but, but before uh, and, and, and after. And especially if, if you have a risk of treating a patient that is asymptomatic and you don't know what is her status, um, you should change all your equipment uh, between one procedure and the other. Uh, one important thing to take into account is um, your screening measures. This can be very variable. In certain places, all staff and all patients will be screened, will be screened either by PCR or by antibodies. And if you have this measure put in place uh, before the starting of the treatment, you can work, I would say, not more safely, but more knowing what you have in front of you. In the cases when you cannot perform these screening methods, then you have to consider that all samples and all patients are potentially infectious. So you need to behave uh, in, in a different way, depending on what, whether you are screening or not, staff and patients. Sorry, I would like to follow with one more question from our very own Joe Simpson from United States. Should embryologists handling embryos undergo antibody testing before returning to work? That's for Anna again. Would you, would you suggest antibody testing to the embryologist before returning to work? As, as I said before, each center needs to put in place the safety measure that they consider the best. 
And also, this depends on the availability of tests. There are places where the tests are not available, so you, you cannot perform them. And also, there is a big limitation, not only on the availability, but also on the uh, accuracy of what we get. If you um, use a test that has 70% uh, sensibility or specificity, then um, the result that you get is um, limited. So at the end, there is still um, a way um, to try to avoid um, increasing uh, the possibility of, of infection, but 100% guarantee is, is never achieved, but not only in that, in, in many procedures that, that we do in biology and in medicine. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Linda, uh, again, each question is actually really difficult because there are no clear answers here. But um, uh, Dr. V. Liu from, uh, wants to know, uh, Dr. Linda, that do patients undergoing ART require coronavirus uh, testing? So essentially what we want, everybody wants to know, should we test all the patients? And uh, what today is the conclusion about transmission from mother to child? From all the information that we have, what can we at the present moment conclude? Thank you. Um, I think my colleagues have also addressed in their individual components about um, testing. Uh, there are different ways to ascertain uh, test. Uh, well, first of all, the, the virus itself. So a positive test is quite reliable that there's active infection going on. Um, and if one has active infection, I think we saw from what uh, Dr. Horton uh, pre presented uh, in the last pathway of the ESHRA guidelines, that would be a red zone and not to proceed with uh, an ART cycle, even from the beginning. Um, the issue of antibody testing is one that is quite controversial, as you've just heard from Dr. Viega. Um, and until we get reliable tests with high accuracy, um, we are going to need to do some very simple ways of evaluating whether or not patients have um, COVID-19, because they could be asymptomatic. Um, one would be to get a history of, um, of, of any symptoms. Another would be to ask about any contacts that they have had that they know uh, who may have had the infection. Another would be to take the temperature of a patient. Um, and so, and there are many other ways of doing this. So overall, I think one needs to um, develop a system that works for the program that is achievable uh, for the um, layout of the program and the resources available. The, the second question was about That's vertical sure. transmission. And I know that Dr. Makano mentioned that uh, life goes on outside of ART, and that's true. And no professional organization to date has recommended that uh, anyone avoid pregnancy and conceiving naturally. Um, that said, there are tidbits of information that I think we do need to keep in mind with regard to possible vertical transmission, and also with regard to the effects of um, COVID-19 on a pregnancy and on a woman's health. So the, uh, it's important that as we look to um, achieving pregnancy, whether naturally or through assisted reproductive technologies, that we are aware that there are potential risks and that we keep those in mind. Again, we have almost no data on first trimester exposures uh, or second trimester or genetic variation that might dictate how a, um, a woman or a fetus may respond to a viral infection, this viral infection. So um, there's so much um, sort of confusion, j just to take that a little further. Uh, if in an ideal situation, a little bit later, maybe when tests are more easily available, would it be, if I have the test, should I test every patient coming in for ART or should I just try it, given a choice? If the test. tests are accurate, have high accuracy. PCR. Um, 
in the wake of this pandemic, it's likely that there will be um, an effort to do over testing than to uh, make assumptions that based on current symptoms in a presenting patient um, would um, lead one to believe that she or he um, would be not, uh, not actively infected and asymptomatically. So I suspect that there will come a time when the tests are accurate, that we will have widespread use of those. Um, and when you look at testing that we do now for HIV and for hepatitis C and hepatitis B um, and, and the variety of other tests that we do, um, it, it's likely that tests for COVID, um, SARS-CoV-2 will be added to that list over time. Right. So triple H and C maybe. Yeah. I think maybe I can take, take it from uh, where she's left and ask Ma Dr. Marcus the question from our basal serologist from Greece. He's asked the question. He's, a he's going to be hosting the next IFFS World Conference in the years to come. And he's asked, where are we with antibody tests? When should we use them and when the molecular ones? So how would it differentiate? Yeah. I I think that uh, one of the things that we have to bear in mind is this, the prevalence that you have in your country at the moment. And it's very important to see what time of the pandemic, of the epidemic in your country is. Because, for example, now, if I want to test antibodies in, in Argentina, the prevalence is quite low. It's like 0.3% of the population. So it would be quite unlikely that I will test positive, to, any patient will test positive at, at this moment, but probably in two months it will be different. So if I had the availability, now I would test uh, obviously all patients and staff with a PCR test, but because we are having cases and we don't have so many cases resolved already. But uh, the, for example, we, we can't do uh, a PCR test to, to all patients. We only have to do it to symptomatic patients. So uh, that, that will depend on the region and on the moment of the pandemic. But I think, as Linda said, the antibody testing in a few months will be probably uh, much higher the prevalence and, and you would get more positive tests. Uh, Dr. Edgar. Another uh, difficult question for you. What if one partner experiences or suffers from COVID-19? Um, is IVF continued or postponed? Maybe so, in the course of the treatment, maybe one of the partners gets infected. And this is asked by Dr. Hermanis Sortono. Thank you for the question. Indeed, um, it depends on when either the symptoms or the diagnosis is made. If it is made before, obviously one should not start the treatment. Um, if it is made during the therapy, and this is not an oncology patient, um, I think uh, there is a strong argument for the time being to postpone treatment. Um, the reasons are multiple. Firstly, it's the presence of this individual that could um, expand the risk of contamination in the service. Um, secondly, we really don't have ultimate proof about um, the presence of the virus in, uh, um, in culture, in dishes, in, um, in um, the laboratory, if we take samples from humans. And thirdly, and I'd like to maybe talk about this, you've asked the question about should we test everybody, we have to remember we have a duty towards all the other patients, and those patients, there will be a moment in time when they will demand uh, that tests are done. So I might say, I don't want to attend your unit unless you test everybody, because I don't want to get it. Yeah. Uh, so that angle is crucially important too. So I think while we say it is safe to start practice, I think the triage and the ensuring that only patients that don't have symptoms, only patients that are at extremely low risk will be starting. Because if we don't start with the safest group of patients, I think we leave ourselves open 
to taking high risks? So yes, the answer will be if you have a patient or their partner being diagnosed or um, highly suspect of having um, SARS-CoV-2 infection, you should discontinue the therapy and uh, follow up with isolation, full diagnosis and so on. So you are saying that patient halfway through stimulation, she's taken 10 days of uh, stimulation and then maybe develops fever or her partner develops fever and is found to be positive. Should we drop the cycle or should we go ahead and retrieve the eggs and freeze maybe? Or Because we are worried about that patient spends so much money and then 10 days later we drop the cycle. Yes. Um, the answer is yes. I believe that we should discontinue the treatment in the interest of safeguarding both the health of everybody else and also the health of a future child. And um, this should be, in fact, part of the uh, code of conduct uh, where we explain to our patients that, look, we don't know if anybody will develop it, but as a precautionary measure, if one patient is diagnosed, we have good arguments, or their partner, we have good argument to say, please don't continue the treatment. Okay. Thank you. In fact, I was actually uh, listening to Dr. Forban from US. They, are, uh, they have offered the patient that if she develops symptoms, she, because they are worried that she may not disclose it, and because they have already used up the medicine, so they have created a system where they will refund the medicine back, or the farmers will give them a subsidy if down in the middle of the treatment, there is a positivity and the cycle is cancer. So that, that will encourage patients to come out with the symptoms rather than hiding the symptoms. There's this question to Dr. Anna and uh, this is from Maria Belen Garcia. Risk of vitrifying patient gamete positive has to be in thermos or quarantine. She's asked that uh, if there's a patient who is positive, should she uh, should we quarantine the embryos in a thermos or whatever? I mean, I cannot I cannot hear you very clearly. So uh, the question is about the presence of the virus in in, in gametes. Is that no? The, the question is risk of vitrifying patient gametes which are positive. What are the risks? Uh, well, we have both presented that uh, both Linda and, and myself. As far as we know. There is no um, evidence of the presence of the virus in sperm. There are two papers that show that the, the virus is not there in, in, in COVID-positive patients. There are no data uh, in follicular fluid. And if we don't have the data in follicular fluid, we cannot extrapolate um, into what is the presence of the virus attached to the oocyte. And as I said in my presentation, it seems from one single paper that uh, embryos can have receptors and the mach machinery necessary for the replication of the virus and at, at different developmental stages. But again, it's only one paper with very uh, limited data. And also, um, I repeat that um, the protection of the zona pellucida is something that we need to take into account. The embryos are protected by the zona pellucida, and because of this, they should not be uh, exposed to the virus, even there, if there is a virus in, in, in the culture system. Another important thing to mention, and maybe this was not highlighted enough in my presentation, is that all the procedures that we do in the IVF lab uh, include lots of washing and lots of dilution of the samples. So we uh, transport our oocytes and our embryos from one dish to the other in very small volumes. Even if we have a certain concentration of the virus in the culture medium, which is, I would say, something that we could um, theoretically uh, expect, by doing these dilutions, these washing steps, when we transport our gametes and embryos into the culture dishes for the different procedures, that dilution would be so high that the possibility of infection would become really um, something really very, very, very limited. I think, you know, I just uh, also uh, put another question, which has come from one of the senior embryologists, Yona Barak from Israel. 
and she is asked similar question as there is no evidence for the existence of ACE2 receptor on the sperm. Would you suggest to make changes in sperm processing for IVF and IUI? So no. I, obviously the answer is no. No, the answer is no. And I take the opportunity to say hello to Yona Barak. Uh, it's a long time since I haven't seen her. And thank you for thank her for the question. I would say that the procedures that we use in the lab are safe enough. And we um, I think that what the methodology that we use, as I said before, makes a uh, high dilution in the different steps. And in the case of the sperm preparation, I would do exactly um, the same as we are doing now. Gradient um, preparation um, allows uh, a selection of sperm. And if on top of that you perform ICSI, I would say that uh, we are on the safe side. Uh, Anna, it was good that you uh, pointed out this. these webinars are giving us so much opportunity to interact with people across the globe uh, while we still continue to stay in the comfort of our homes. So one of the very few rays of sunshine during this uh, terrible pandemic. Um, uh, so uh, we go on to another important question, uh, Dr. Marcos. Uh, the question is, uh, how about a mother who is unknown before as a carrier of COVID, and then she receives an ART. So she's a carrier, she's asymptomatic, we are not testing everybody, and we go ahead and do the embryo transfer, and then we determine that she is a carrier or has an infection, not symptomatic. What do we do? This question is from Dr. Sintha Utami. Okay, thank you. Um, these are the cases that we, I mean, the, the, the number of asymptomatic patients is apparently very high. Th there's different uh, publications that are showing, for example, in the pregnant patient population, it could be up to 70% of the pregnant patients that have tested positive for COVID in New York City were asymptomatic, completely asymptomatic. So uh, this is a big population, is a base of the pyramid, and we have to uh, act as if everybody has it. That's that's the take home message. If you if you won't be able to uh, test, you have to consider everybody coming into the clinic should wear a face mask and the patients in the in the OR will have to have a face mask, too. We are doing it right now in, in that way, because these asymptomatic patients have a high probability of propagation of the virus because they have a high viral load in the upper respiratory tract. So I think that if you find if you really find that that patient has turned symptomatic in during the course of the treatment i think i agree with edgar you should stop and cancel unless you know she has a lot of eggs and she's uh, the day before to the you could consider some cases but uh, you should cancel all of those cases because they will propagate the virus inside your your art center so uh, as an extension to this, if this patient is now has already undergone the transfer and is now found to be a carrier or turns positive, uh, would you start medications? For example, hydroxychloroquine? Uh, what about its safety no, no, no. in pregnancy? I don't think so. Um, I mean, the, the data is very scarce, but uh, what we know about hydroxychloroquine at the moment, uh, none of the trials are, are, are are giving uh, enough, uh, uh, I mean, there's no information of a benefit with, with uh, either hydroxychloroquine or, or a lot of other uh, um, medicines. But uh, there's some information on remdesivir in, in, in very ill patients, but I don't think it's, it's good to do a, a prophylaxis, a prophylactic treatment or, or, you know, if the patient is okay and she's not having a severe uh, case, you, you should not treat with anything, especially if she's pregnant. I think uh, I'll ask a question to Edgar. In the informed consent for IVF cycle, do we document the uncertain effect of COVID? Suppose we take the consent. Do we document that there is an uncertainty of various things? This is a question asked by Dr. Minu Handa from India. I think um, every patient or every couple that starts ART treatment should have part of the consent, the uncertainty of, um, and the consequences 
for both the woman that becomes pregnant and in pregnancy. We know a bit about late pregnancy. We know not a lot about early pregnancy uh, and also about the health of the child. And this also should be included in all oncology cases. Uh, remember the previous question I was asked, should we continue or not? Obviously, if an oncology patient needs to continue the therapy, uh, the important question will be if I freeze my eggs, is there a risk that I could get COVID after the um, oocytes are processed in the laboratory or my child will be affected? We don't know. <coughs> the, the importance of adequate consent lies in the fact that we can say we don't know, but you have the option to come at that time and discuss should you use them with the knowledge that would have accumulated, we'll be able to give you advice. Um, maybe your fertility returns, and in that case, you don't need to worry. You get pregnant spontaneously, and you have no need to use the crop reserved. But to come back to the question, should we discuss the unknown about uh, the impact of SARS-CoV-2 upon the health of that embryo and the health of the child? Yes. And we also should not panic patients. Um, because nobody gives uh, advice in the bedroom. Uh, uh, two people at home don't ask the, anybody, uh, is there any risk of having a child if uh, we have intercourse and I become pregnant? So why should we uh, panic those patients that come for ART? I don't think we should, but I think we should uh, present the evidence that we have to date the fact that we have no true evidence that there is the possibility of contamination of gametes and there's uh, no evidence of uh, vertical transmission through laboratory processing. Yes. I would like to just add something to this conversation um, about the importance of registries and studies to begin to document um, patient characteristics and how patients respond and what the outcomes are. Um, the Cochrane program, for instance, has a pregnancy and uh, child, uh, child outcome uh, around COVID-19. At our own institution, we have the priority study, which is for pregnancy outcomes in COVID-19 positive women. And um, Dr. Eleni uh, Swanza at UCSF also has a new study called the ASPIRE study, uh, looking at uh, pregnancy outcomes in first trimester um, exposures. So it's not just in our institution, but across the globe, I think we all have a responsibility to um, begin to record the data so that we will then not have to have all these conversations about, oh, we just don't know, but we begin to accumulate information that is evidence-based uh, so that we can then appropriately counsel our patients in the future. Dr. Linda, there's a question uh, from me about consent forms. Has any organization made standardized consent forms, uh, which we all can follow with minor tweaking for individual countries? So uh, do we have anything already which we can download and start using? So I am not aware that, um, I know IFFS does not have um, con uh, formal consent forms or a, a, a structure, uh, a draft of one, uh, a prototype. Um, I do not believe that ASRM does, but they may, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, and I look to my European colleagues whether ESHRA has a consent prototype. Most, most consent forms are um, very unique to the institution and most institutions have regulations about what has to be included. But of course, there's a huge amount of input from uh, those who are obtaining the consent and also those who are receiving the consent uh, with regard to uh, what should go into them. Um, but having some baseline language may be helpful. Um, Anna, you looked like you were about to say something about the I issue. I would request you, Linda, if, if IFS can bring out, obviously, a very broad consent guideline. And then, you know, so that we don't omit or miss out on some very important points. And then each one can individualize it to their uh, unique situations. But that will be very helpful. Uh, 
I would if like I to... add something, um, for example, the Spanish Fertility Society taking all recommendations uh, from different other societies and, and, and associations uh, is putting in place a consent form, yes. which in fact is part of the collection of different consent forms that this society, the Spanish Fertility Society, is distributing to all members of the Spanish Fertility Society, and uh, they can be used by, by anyone that wishes or adapted. And I think that every center has to adapt um, yeah. the consent form to, to their own situation. Mm. I think, uh, Dr. Anna, I would like to ask you one, two questions that come uh, for you. One is that from Dr. Nandita Parshetka from India. What about the infection in ICSI? The denudation of eggs <laughs> may be dangerous. And there's another question from Dr. Sunita Arora in India. During laser hatching, if you do laser hatching for improving pregnancy rate, would it be dangerous to do it in this COVID time? I, I, I hear you very badly. Uh, is she asking about um, doing ICSI? Yeah. Is it dangerous to do ICSI? Um, you know, because you're denuding the eggs. And is it dangerous to do assisted hatching? This is, this is a very good question. And in fact, we already have that question in, in our website uh, at the ASHRAE COVID uh, section. Um, we are saying that um, probably uh, all sites are not exposed to the virus, but imagine that you have a certain concentration of virus in, in your sperm sample, which has not been proved, but imagine that you have this. And what if you introduce this virus inside of the your site when performing the ICSI? Um, I do not have um, a, an answer for that. Um, but what I would say is first, it has not been proved that you can have um, a virus in the sperm sample. Maybe if the sperm sample is contaminated by an embryologist who is having the infection, you could have some virus in there. Uh, but I don't know what would happen if um, you are doing ICSI and you are introducing a, a virus inside uh, of your site. I have, I have no idea. Uh, at the end, and I think there was a paper um, at the time of uh, uh, the uh, AIDS uh, pandemic uh, showing that, in fact, em embryos and all sites could not be infected by HIV. Um, we should put in place um, a study trying to show if all sites and embryos that are exposed to the virus, but exposed to, a, I would say, a high concentration of virus, get infected by them. And doing also this kind of experiment, trying to introduce the virus inside of, of the your site. Obviously, there are uh, ethical concerns in trying to do uh, this kind of experiments, but in places where um, embryo research is, is, is allowed, this, this could be uh, a study that could be uh, envisaged. Yeah, uh, I have another question, and um, uh, Dr. Edgar, would you like to address that from uh, Dr. Shuli Mukherjee? Uh, question on everybody's mind, actually. What is the mode of practice in ovum pickup techniques and anesthesia? Because we're all worried about general anesthesia, which we use for OPU. So what, what is your take on that? Dr. Edgar? Hey, uh, yes, uh, thank you. The, so there are two aspects, the anesthesia. I think there is a lot of scope for either regional anesthesia or pseudoanalgesia, IV anesthesia, but no intubation. Uh, if you need to intubate a patient, good current practice uh, will say that you need to use some protective uh, airways uh, covers so you actually do not get infected. You need the N95 masks and uh, screens and so on to reduce the risk of being contaminated. Um, the, in terms of the vaginal approach, um, there is no reason to use a different approach, and I can't see how we can reduce the risk, considering that we would avoid uh, sterilizing agents on the vaginal wall and will avoid any sterilizing agent for the, um, uh, you know, liquid sterilizing agents for needles and, and um, duct and tubes, of course. So 
it will be mainly related to anesthesia and the least invasive the anesthetic procedure, the least the risk for the anesthetist to be contaminated. Um, so obviously, prevention will still be first. So if you can reduce the risk of somebody being uh, infected, uh, then you'll have far less chance that uh, somebody will reach you unless it's an oncology case, which is a known case. And then general hospital rules of protection will apply. So should all of us try, now that we are changing so many of the practice uh, techniques, should we all try to go towards local anesthesia or no anesthesia or just a sedation during our pickups? Because up until now, almost all of our cases were general anesthesia. Okay, well, I'm not a woman, but uh, even if I would be, I would not let anybody come near me with a neck pickup needle. So uh, I would never advertise having no anesthesia, um, particularly in the circumstances where uh, the response could be uh, a good response. So yeah. you will have to puncture multiple follicles. If it's a, a minimal stimulation with three follicles, maybe with a very fine um, kitazato needle, you might just pick up uh, those oocytes. But in general, you should offer anesthesia. Um, I confess, uh, pseudoanalgesia, midazolam, and fentanyl IV works beautifully. As long as you have low-risk patients, uh, it can be done very safely in a controlled manner. You could do local anesthesia also. It depends on the um, tolerability of the individual patient also. Some um, uh, patients, uh, you can do hysteroscopy with a yeah. no difficulty, for example, without anesthesia even. Uh, other patients uh, could not tolerate it. So yeah. you need to adapt to the patient. But if we can reduce the number of patients that receive a general anesthetic, you have benefits in terms of uh, risk you take, you have benefits in terms of cost, you have benefits in terms of recovery. So there are multiple benefits there. True. Uh, can we ask one question to Dr. Linda? This is uh, from Alexia Chatsi Parsidu. She's a embryologist from, uh, I think, Greece, and she has asked, how do we separate rotating groups of medical personnel and their patients from interacting between them? The question was, how do we separate groups of medical students? Personnel. Personnel. Or medical personnel. And the patients, you know, from interacting ah. between the groups. Oh, so this is a logistical thing in terms of um, the practice and the unit. Uh, I think Dr. Horton um, went through this um, to really um, explain how important it is to not have a crowded uh, waiting room, for instance, um, if you are on the 10th floor of a building, uh, you know, you need an elevator to get up. How do you monitor um, and, and limit the number of people in the elevator uh, as you're going to, um, as patients are coming up and down? Um, the, the, the first part, again, is um, um, testing and also um, looking for symptoms for infection, so prevention and um, trying to keep colleagues uh, at a reasonable distance. So social distancing, or maybe we can call it colleague distancing uh, at uh, some people say six feet, um, others say 12 feet. Um, and sometimes that's hard to do when you have a room say where the nursing staff is, or you have uh, trainees, residents and medical students in a room uh, that may be small. So we really need, and I think Dr. Makano uh, underscored this, how important it is to remember that we need to change the way we do things. And the distancing is part of it, wearing a mask, washing your hands, um, being aware of any symptoms uh, that may be consistent with um, an infection and granted they're asymptomatic individuals. Um, so it's a, it's a a congregation of uh, a variety of approaches to frankly minimize the interactions and humans are social animals, so it's very hard to do that. Um, but we are in a new world and we need to be very cognizant of, of these precautions. 
Thank you. I think we are drawing to the end of uh, our time, though we are not drawing to the end of the questions. There are lots and lots more questions. We have thousands of doctors uh, tuned in, and uh, I think we'll have to do one huge more session just taking questions and answers uh, from all the people and generally important. And, uh, and that really underlines uh, the situation today that sometimes there are more questions than there are answers. So um, we will leave the rest of the questions to another day and uh, say a big, big thank you to all the IFFS leadership for being with us today and uh, sharing so many uh, insights and um, huge uh, knowledge that they have uh, with all of us uh, across the globe who have tuned in at different times of the day, different time zones to um, understand so that we can safely go back to practice and protect ourselves and protect our patients. So uh, if you haven't filled in the uh, uh, poll, or the evaluation, please do so. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, there will be a certificate which will be uh, sent to all our uh, uh, doctors and personnel who have uh, tuned in. And this uh, particular program will be available to you in a taped version. It will be sent to you, a recording of this. So um, I would, from my side and from Rishikesh's side, like to say a big, big thank you to all of you. And Linda, if you'd like to um, conclude the session uh, with a few words. Yes, thank you so much. Um, first, I want to thank all of our speakers and our moderators um, for this very unique program and very timely. Um, I also want to thank Dr. Rishma Pai and Dr. Rishikesh Pai for helping to put this program on and to thank um, the Science Integra for the IT engine uh, of this program that was really so, so well done. Um, also want to acknowledge the support of INTAS for this educational program and uh, also Ms. Kristen Burke, who is at the IFFS Secretariat, who did a huge amount of work behind the scenes, and we're very grateful for that. And then last but not least, I want to thank all of the participants. The great questions um, and having such a large audience across the world, um, we really appreciate your participation. And we are all in this together. Um, we are still learning. Uh, things are still changing by the day, uh, but this, Hopefully we'll be over relatively soon, um, but we have a lot to learn and a lot to apply over the next days, weeks, months, perhaps years. Um, and I want to thank everybody. So safety and health to all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Thank you.